You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun, and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers, and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 192. When we look back at the drone industry in 2018, what will we say? Well, actually, to answer that question, all we have to do is listen back to what many of my guests had to say. 2018 was a year of innovation, progress, change, optimism, and challenge, as the industry continued to mature and evolve. In this edition of the Drone Radio Show, I compiled short snippets from nearly 50 of my guests on their thoughts on the drone industry, on creating value, and on building a drone-based business. It will provide a great way to end the year. I want to thank my guests for sharing their stories and expertise with me this year. And I want to especially thank you for listening to the podcast, for your emails, likes, shares, messages, and the financial support. As you know, I do the podcast part-time, and it has been a continual learning experience, and your support is truly appreciated. I have some new ideas for 2019, which I hope will translate into greater value and an enhanced listener experience. You've been a great audience, and I wish all of you a very happy new year. So as the year draws to a close, let's sit back and hear from some of the leaders of the drone industry. By 2020, it's expected to have about 7 million small unmanned aircraft systems or drones in the sky. And out of those 7 million, there will be 2.6 million commercial operations. So you quickly realize that the current way of managing traffic may not scale. You also have to calibrate your technology to filter out other disturbances, cell phones, machinery, a vehicle, an airplane engine. So once you begin to understand the algorithms and you are filtering these things out, you're also able to see what they are. So by default, we began to detect other types of threats. Drones aren't just kind of gathering data, but they're helping to actually diagnose the problem. And my kind of outlook on the future of drones is where they're not going to just be capturing the data, looking at it, diagnosing the problem. They're actually going to go there and they're going to fix the problem. It's just reassuring to know that I have this great resource that I can tap into and quickly say, hey, you know what, I'm kind of unsure in this, or can you help me out with that? Or I really need a speaker or a panelist in a pinch. Who could you recommend? And sometimes these conversations can even lead to an article or just repositioning our messaging. And that to us is really worth its weight in gold. It was like, holy cow, there's 120,000 drone pilots here. What are they using to share this information? And it turns out nothing outside of traditional block storage, like the Google Drives and the, the One Drives and Dropboxes and what have you. Or they were delivering their uh, photos and videos on a hard drive. If we can increase endurance by 50%, by increasing the fuel efficiency of the engine, you could actually double or triple the time that an aircraft has to do its mission when it's actually over the area where it's trying to get to. The technology always moves much faster than the legislation, but even more importantly, it's the philosophy and the culture behind it. So uh, we can make a drone today, and many people have, that can accurately deliver and land in your backyard. It's really the, the bigger cultural and social acceptance of doing that. So we just recently had a waiver that will allow us to work on a 50-mile stretch of our transmission line in the Denver, Colorado area. But we expect to expand that program to all 10 states. We have to detail out the beyond visual line of sight operations. We have to address security concerns, and we have to address the local concerns and how they interact with the federal government. And to do that, there's no better way than to actually conduct operations in a local community and learn from them before we write rules. Our main differentiator is that instead of paying as you fly, you can pay how you fly. So it's a platform that is deeply connected to the piloting profile of the operator, and it is much more adequate to the risk itself. The drone operator won't tell you how that drone operates in high winds, what its fail-safe mechanisms are, what its payload is going to be. And if, if they did tell you, 
It'll be out of date in six months' time, which obviously makes the MSPs extremely twitchy when they try and plan for how they're going to mix man and unmanned uh, vehicles in the same airspace. Seeing, you know, your backyard or the city that you live in from above is still really enticing. And that's enticing to kind of a universal audience. I don't see that changing because the content creators are constantly pushing the limits with what type of media they're creating. And then there's always going to be something unique found when you view it from above. So the UberX will drop you off at a skyport and you'll be able to get on your aircraft, your EV toll to fly across the city and land at a, another skyport very, very quickly, flying at anywhere from 150 miles per hour to 200 miles per hour to get across the city while the rest of the city is stuck in uh, gridlock. Anybody that says we want to fly over people and doesn't advocate for a practical test for as part of the UAS certificate, in my estimation, is, uh, is making an ass out of themselves. I mean, we don't even know if people can fly these things. This industry is not just made up of people who fly drones. There are women and men who design the drones, or they're the ones who are coming up with accessories for the drones. They're the photographers. There's just so much opportunity in this industry. And um, we just wanted to create a place for women in particular to connect. If there's an incident tomorrow, man, all these laws will change. All this stuff will be out there. People will be tasked to build this stuff right now because just the sheer pandemonium and craziness that will ensue. There are plenty of entrepreneurs writing algorithms, doing code, coming up with novel ideas that does not require a large corporation. And they're agile and they're hungry to do something. And so that's really powerful moving quickly and at the speed at which Softworks and Thunder Drone want to move. Thanks to the development of photogrammetric software, it's possible to collect pictures and to process pictures and to develop 3D models uh, that are very, very accurate. That's very interesting for archaeologists because photogrammetric documentation allows also to standardize the quality of the documentation. You really have to stay open to redesigning your company to the sales that you can make need to allow sales to drive your infrastructure, not the other way around. Because if you build an infrastructure for something that nobody wants, you're going to have to change it. So it's one thing to say, hey, the drone is great for search and rescue, or it's great for accident reconstruction, or it's great for doing topographical maps. All of these things are great, but people are now starting drone programs and figuring out how they will integrate UAV into their workflow. So what we're working on is specifically on using parachutes for flight over people to make them safe, you know, which is where it's headed. They're not going to let you fly a drone over people without some kind of safety system. It isn't going to happen. They've got some money. They're going to go out and get a solution. They know nothing about the technology, but they see a fancy demo and they're impressed by it and they spend their money. And then we see the demo by the same people And we go through it and start asking questions and find out that it's not quite what they say it is. An essential first step is changing 336 so there is no compliance loophole. And that comes back to a matter of legislation. That's something the Congress has to do. The FAA cannot change it. In fact, the court has told them they cannot change it. It's bitterly opposed by the AMA, though they now recognize there's going to have to be some give. And that's where we sit. We get a uh, call from the guy because he's actually talking on cellular telephone with one of the negotiators and basically says, if my phone dies, I die and I have 3% battery left. So my commander asked me, are we able to carry a payload with the aircraft? Our members generally take a more pragmatic approach to utilizing newer technologies. We are in dangerous industrial environments with hazardous materials, flammable materials, etc., so anytime you integrate a new tool into your toolbox, you have to have a great safety case. They aren't familiar with the regulatory requirements. They aren't familiar with the technology. They know this is something that we need to do. This is something that agencies around us are doing. Everybody seems to be doing it a little bit differently. We have these missions that we want to complete, but we don't know how to put A, B, and C together to get an operable program. I need to plug this data into the asset management system. 
typically you'll get the answer from the IT department, which asset management system? Uh, we've got six. And various pieces of information about that asset is stored in different systems. There's the financial one for depreciation. We've got the manuals in another system. We've got the ordering system, the workflow system. There's a lot of companies that start off this process with asking about what it means for them to form a drone program. And that's not always the right question to be asking. Typically, a better question to ask at the beginning of that process is, what kind of business objectives am I trying to solve? While many people see hours and they see liability, these companies are seeing ROI. They're seeing dollars. They're seeing, wow, we're working more efficiently. We have a new tool that lets us get more work done faster and safer. And they're not thinking about a drone program. They're thinking about the efficiencies that they're gaining from their existing workforce. If you're an accountant in one of these organizations, you know, you want to receive data in a specific way. You want to be able to take that inventory data and turn it into something that can be consumed within your ERP or your accounting system and then be able to track it over time. We need to continue to be able to develop this technology to keep drones in the air for longer and carrying larger payloads and to get this high-end work done. But once you have that, you're opening up not just one industry, but multiple industries to utilizing these advanced flying robots for data collection in a way that you haven't been able to get data and analyze it before. So many people are trying to build this Swiss army knife, one size fits all that fits every mission. And the aviation market is just not designed that way. It's a very energy intensive and energy critical situation. You really have to design an aircraft that's suited for the mission that you're trying to fulfill. If you give me a video from a drone or any camera really, I could translate it into the space that it represents. Once you have this, you could place objects in this space and they will behave as if they are really there. They're just becoming so embedded. They're just another operational tool. And I think they're being used to save manpower, money, and to protect in any instant where it's dangerous to send a human being. So we have these two different categories of people using drones, really people using the drones as the main tool and people using drones every once in a while because it makes part of their job easier. I polled about 21 people that are kind of the top unmanned aircraft systems in public safety around the country and asked, have unmanned aircraft systems met the expectations that you had going in? And across the board, the answer was, we have exceeded what we thought would happen with unmanned aircraft systems. We're building a venue for clients to come in, do research and development on platforms and sensors and C2 links and, and whatever in an area where we have situational awareness on what's out there. I think the most interesting aspect would be to see all of these great, excellent, and well-talented teams put their ideas together, put their efforts together, and come up with some amazing products. Because a team that can build a drone with these particular specifications is a team that we believe can do just about anything. The industry is still really young. You know, as much as I've been flying over the last five years, it's still really new. And there's a lot of growth to be had, but it has to kind of be done really smartly. And getting in too early in the wrong direction is just sort of a dead end. So our ultimate goal, of course, since it is driven by economics and economic development, is to attract companies to move to Utah and particularly to the rural counties of Tooele and Box Elder. You know, up to now, I've seen a lot of assumptions made around the monetary benefits. Everyone just assumes, oh, when we get beyond visual line of sight, the growth in the industry is going to hockey stick. We're going to be under Part 107 waiver requirement for a long time, maybe 10 years. If you look at the FEA's roadmap to when we're going to get beyond visual line of sight, that is specialized operations, it's a long way off, which means that businesses, if they want to do beyond visual line of sight mapping and inspection, they need to understand the economic efficiencies of beyond visual line of sight versus the current operation of visual line of sight if they want to make the business case to their executive. If you're a woman, access to capital remains one of the biggest issues. Women are oftentimes the last person to get funded. Are you hireable? I said, well, yeah. So then do it. Go start a business. If it doesn't work out, go get a job. It's like, well, that kind of grossly oversimplifies things, but okay. The biggest challenge was actually finding a great team, advisors, the community partners, so that they could hold me accountable 
and to help me prioritize. That's awesome. And to be able to have a, a community to do that, there are those those networking catalyzers, the people that want to help you for just helping sake. Uh, because I, you know, I have no problem focusing on 12,000 things at once, but to be able to have a, a community of folks to say, you should probably do this first, next, and never, <laughs> definitely helps. You have to maintain your reputation. You also have to accurately value what you deliver. You know, don't compromise. On top of that, it's not just about the job. It's about forging relationships. So the photography or videography part is only half of the equation. I think customer service is huge. Editing is huge. Delivering the product on time is huge. Being nice is huge. Every time that we get into a hard problem, people tell us that it's impossible. And I think that's the reason why nobody has done it before is because people think that something is impossible. And the only way to solve those problems and, and challenges is to just, just keep going and, and kind of power through it. And I think that's what sets apart the successful game-changing innovators from other folks. So I would just say just keep at it and solve tough challenges. It's so important to hear other stories, to understand from other people, learn from their experience and you know just listen. And I think that choosing the right investors is crucial. You want investors that can help you, that understand you, and they basically really want to help. First and foremost, have to solve a meaningful and crucial problem. Secondly, the solution should be adequate for the problem. The team should come with the right abilities to solve these problems. So these two factors, a meaningful problem and the unique solutions, are two ingredients that should be apparent in each and every startup. Learn how it's being solved today. Learn who's solving it today. Develop a prototype based on uh, that learning. Test it, refine it, bring it to market, and maybe even pivot. One of the things that, that we had to do numerous times is change direction. The market ebbs and flows. The drone industry is really in its infancy. Even if you look at Section 333, the industry as a whole has only been around for five to six years as we know the commercial industry today, right? So identify that problem, really drill down to understand that problem, create a solution to that problem, and then go out there and market that solution. I see a lot of folks who get into the industry and say, I'm going to fly drones that can do everything. And I I think that's where a lot of the frustration is coming from because it's hard. You can't be an expert in every vertical all the time. So really find a problem, specialize and nail down that problem, create a solution, and then scale that solution out. I, I would say do as much as you can with as little as you can, right? Be, be very scrappy. I think that's what a lot of people look for. You know, try to be very capital efficient. There, there was an example concerning Zappos, a shoe company, online shoe company. Um, and when they started out, they literally had the assumption of okay, well, people buy shoes online. This was in the early days of the internet. And they didn't say, okay, well, people need to buy shoes online. We need to go out and get all these contracts and deals and work with Nike and Adidas. And then we have to buy two big warehouses on either coast and fill them with shoes and get all these salespeople. Like they just went down to a footlocker and they took pictures of the shoes with a a cheap digital camera, put it on a cheap website and all of a sudden they were getting thousands of orders. They would go down to the Foot Locker, put the stuff in the mail and send it to the people, right? So they kind of validated their assumptions early and cheaply. And that's really the most important and vital thing that you can do as an entrepreneur, you know, not try to have the mentality of like, if I build it, they will come. Well, I think the most important thing is that if you have a vision and you have a good basis for that vision, keep after it. It's amazing how many times you hear no. I had friends tell me, friends who knew how enthusiastic I was about model aircraft and drones and aircraft in general, and aviation in general. They said, oh, you're too early or nobody's going to need this or this is not something that's going to be a viable product. And then you know, we went to dozens and dozens of meetings with venture capitalists and you know, either you're sitting there educating them on why this is a good idea and they go invest in somebody else or they just some, some of them just outright insult you. I had you know somebody we were in a pitch meeting. John and I are showing them all these metrics and the great traction we're having. And he's eating his lunch after he kept us waiting for like a half hour. And he's eating his lunch. And he goes, all right, OK. He goes, but at the end of the day, you're just two guys in a website. And I, I just remember sitting there thinking I like. 
all right, even if, even if you broke out the checkbook now, I wouldn't take your money because how many projects start out as two guys on the website? And it was, you know, at first it was a little disheartening, but when you do it over and over and over and you understand that your value proposition is worth it and that you're building something really special, you don't worry about the, the people that say you're just two guys on the website. They're going to miss out and it's a shame that they did. We really focused in on a, a couple of use cases that were really impactful to organizations. I think that to me is the key to success in any market, but particularly in the drone marketplace where you have a commoditized hardware platform in the form of DJI. You know, how do you innovate and really deliver value be above and beyond either on that platform or take the Kespri model of, of, of building your own platform? It really has to be focused on a particular pain area. You have to be very enthusiastic about what you're doing. That's true for any entrepreneur, because if you're not, then it's hard. If you're not, you will give up. So you need to be very enthusiastic about what you're doing. You also need to be smart. You don't need to do something just because you're enthusiastic about it. Build a plan that it may not be the right plan, but at least shows that you have some chances of, of making it. Because if you cannot justify it to yourself, then uh, you probably cannot make it. Once you have a plan, execute. Examine your plan daily. Change it daily, but execute. Do stuff. Bring yourself to the market. Bring yourself to the market before you're ready. If you're not, as somebody said, if you're not ashamed of your first release, you waited too long. To be able to make a dent in this industry and be able to generate some revenue, you have to be totally and utterly committed to it. We started off, like I said, in 2015 and just kind of experimented. Our first year was really not, I wouldn't say we didn't really know exactly what we were doing or where we were going at that time. And things have changed so much since then. But with the model that we've got this year, there's definitely profit to be made. But I think what it comes down to is, is grit and determination and staying totally involved in the industry. You need to be the best at your price point. We're not going to be the cheapest ever, but we can say we're going to deliver the best product at our price point. That's to me where you need to be. And again, it's just having something else besides just real estate aerial photography. We went the, the platform slash network route because that adds a little extra into it. Whereas other people go the route of doing inspections for insurance companies or cell phone towers. You know, I want to say you can follow your dreams and make it happen just on your own, but it's just reality. It's just a numbers game. And there's a lot of drone pilots looking for work. I wish we could give jobs to all the people on our site. And we give a lot of jobs out, but you know, there's more pilots than there are jobs really available. So just be realistic about it. I think solution matters. But if you're an entrepreneur, you got to do something that is not the common practice today. We have made the number of unpopular decisions as a startup company. Uh, that I think when we made them because we thought that this was the right step for the company, not what will help us get investors, those were the right decisions that we ended up with. So even if now I'm saying solution matters, technology is a later stage, maybe your startup did the right technology and in two years you're going to see that you were completely right and I was completely wrong. So just do what you set up to do. Do it, you know, not well, but best. And don't give up because it's really a big market is picking up. And you just have to figure out how to place yourself in this emerging wave. Again, it's about building a community and it's about being responsive to people and answering questions and not coming across as fake. You know, I think that's the number one thing. If you come across as fake, people can recognize that. And if you come across as real, people can recognize that as well. Well, you know, what's great is I always tell people when they come to me and say, I'm an entrepreneur, what kind of company should I start? I say, make sure you start something you're passionate about. because. Being an entrepreneur and starting your own company is not a nine to five job. It's a 24 hour a day job, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So if you're going to be doing something that much, it better be something you love. And what's so great about the drone industry is the people in it are just that. They love drones. They love leading edge technology. You know, they're passionate about this industry and what they do. And that I think is showing that in the creativity around the companies that are being created in this space. That's it for episode 192 of the Drone Radio Show. Once again, I want to thank my guests for sharing their insights with me this year. A complete listing of the individuals contributing to this episode can be found on the Drone Radio Show website. 
If you like the Drone Radio Show, please consider supporting the podcast with a small donation. The content is always free, but for as little as $1, you can help defray the cost of production. To donate, go to DroneRadioShow.com slash donate or Patreon.com slash DroneRadioShow. And thanks for listening. Have a happy new year, and I look forward to bringing you more stories in 2019 about drones and the people that use them for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Gortz. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun, or research, and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels.